Well, uh, thank you. I had, uh, uh, as I had spoken with Maurice here uh, several days ago, weeks ago, I had planned on being there, uh, but with the weather the way it is, uh, we're expecting uh, several inches of snow this weekend here in Corvallis, and so uh, I chose not to try to uh, <laughs> to make the, uh, make the trip to Davis. Uh, I grew up in Southern California. We're not very good at driving in snow. And so uh, I try to do that as little as possible. So anyway, a little bit of background on myself. I'm an extension poultry specialist here in the state of Oregon, have been since uh, 1993. Uh, before that, I was a county agent working with poultry uh, here in the state as well. I came here from uh, when I got my degree and I got my degree right there at uh, UC Davis. Uh, working in the avian science department, uh, all my degrees, M a BS, MS, and a PhD in avian genetics uh, from, uh, from Davis. And so I kind of wanted to go back and visit a little bit. I hadn't been to the campus in several years. And so, uh, uh, oh well, the weather just, uh, winter time up here, it's always this way. So anyway, they asked me to talk a little bit about nutrition and feeding, specifically on pastured flocks. Now, one of the things we need to remember is whether they're uh, pastured or whether they're uh, in commercial uh, operations, uh, their nutritional requirements are pretty much the same. Uh, it's simply how we feed them, what we feed them, and things of that nature. So as we begin this discussion, let's take a, first we'll take a look at uh, nutrition versus feeding. Um, we can talk nutrition and then you're going to get very bored with all the chemistry. Uh, and so we're really not going to focus on that. We're going to focus on feeding. Much of the, of the, of the biochemistry and whatever has already been done for us. We, we don't have to understand that to feed chickens well. Uh, also that the feed is uh, one of the highest continuing costs of, of your operation. And so you're going to put a lot of resources into feed. So feeding uh, chickens properly is going to be uh, very important. Uh, and feeding is only a part of an overall good production program. Uh, if other things aren't up to par, then no matter what you feed them, the birds aren't going to perform well. And one of the things we do have to remember are there, are no, there is no magic bullet. There isn't anything out there that uh, we need to feed uh, specifically. Uh, there isn't anything that's going to fix a broken feeding program other than reformulating and purchasing feed that is adequate for the birds that we're, we're dealing with. So if we look at nutrition versus feeding, essentially nutrition is uh, essentially biochemistry. Uh, and, uh, and we don't want to get into that. It's been a long time since I've thought about biochemistry in any uh, direct sense, uh, but we kind of think about it in terms of practical biochemistry. All of the nutrients that we provide uh, the chickens are, are, uh, are going to be broken down and essentially rebuilt uh, as, uh, as poultry uh, protein, pro poultry uh, uh, meat, uh, eggs, all of those kinds of things that we're trying to get out of, the, out of the chickens. And so that is already there. The biology of the hen, her biochemistry is going to make that happen. We're simply got to give them the right things and we're doing that by feeding. And so feeding is a way to get the nutrients in so that the biochemistry can work. Uh, and feeding is essentially just uh, ingredient selection. We're going to take a series of ingredients that are available to us. We're going to formulate them in such a way that they, they hit all of the required nutrients for uh, these animals, depending upon what we're asking them to do. And we're going to allow her biochemistry to uh, take effect to then get her to grow, lay eggs, uh, or whatever we're asking for them. And so, so really nutrition and feeding, we're going to look at the feeding end, the more practical logistic side rather than the nutrition. Also, we have to remember that uh, feed is a major cost, the major cost in producing poultry, whether you're in a small flock with 100 hens or whether your commercial operation was several hundred thousand hens, uh, the, the cost of feed is still very high. It's estimated that uh, the cost of feed is something in excess of 70% of the total continuing cost. Once we're established and we have our coop, we have the birds, uh, the primary cost we're going to have is in the form of feed. That number even goes higher if we're in organic feed or something of that nature. So, uh, so it's uh, important for us to remember that we're spending a lot of dollars feeding these animals 
we need to do the best we can and feed them uh, the best that we can afford because we want them to produce well. We also find that uh, feeding is really only a part of a larger production program. So feed inputs into the, into the hens, uh, but also we can't feed poor genetic hens. We don't have high production stock. We don't purchase good birds. We have mediocre birds. No matter what we feed them, we're never going to reach uh, some higher uh, plane than what their genetics will allow. Conversely, we can purchase the best genetic stock that we can, we can and if we don't feed them well, they'll never reach that, that potential that's been put into them by the, uh, by the company that, that produces those birds. And then all around that, we also have management. We can have the best birds and the best feed, but if we're not managing them well, then no matter what we're feeding them, they're not going to perform well. It's interesting because I see pictures like these on a regular basis on some of the Facebook posts and other things that my hen is a freeloader and I had to go to the grocery store as the one to buy eggs when I have all these hens in the back uh, in the backyard or I haven't laid an egg since November or something of this nature. We have to realize that these are, uh, animals are, uh, are biological entities. They aren't little machines. They aren't going to do things other than what their genetics allows them to do, whatever the uh, environment allows them to do. And so, uh, so oftentimes when these things occur, it's, it's, it's our, our fault for not feeding them well, not managing them well, or not having the best stock. And so, uh, so realize that this is a, a whole concert of things that are impacting these birds. And lastly, in this uh, introductory section here, there's, uh, there's really no magic bullet. Uh, we see all the time nowadays that uh, whenever there's an issue, and I read these uh, often in the, uh, in the Facebook uh, uh, posts and things, uh, feed them fermented feeds and everything is okay, or give them diatomaceous earth in the feed, or uh, certainly apple cider vinegar will fix everything, and it, it won't. Um, it could be used as a part of a complete uh, program, uh, but uh, these things, uh, fermented feeds will, uh, yes, reduce their feed consumption slightly, uh, but they, it comes with drawbacks as well. There's a difficulty in, in doing that. It's an expensive way to feed birds. It's not going to be the panacea for, uh, for production, in, even in small flocks. Apple cider vinegar isn't going to fix sick birds. If, if birds aren't fed well, they get sick or whatever, apple cider vinegar is not going to fix that. It may help to uh, reduce the possibility that they'll get sick by changing the pH in the gut a little bit or something of that nature, but it's not a panacea. Uh, it's going to, uh, has its own drawbacks. Oregano oil has also been mentioned on a regular basis. And these things come up all the time. Uh, and realize that if these things work to the extent that they would, industry would be using them because it would help them out as well. And so part of the objectives that we want to consider when we start feeding poultry is essentially we want uh, healthy, productive flocks of birds. And we're going to start that with, uh, with feeding uh, as far as our management. So we have to manage them well, we have to purchase good stock, and then we need to feed them appropriately. Oftentimes, I will also see on these uh, blogs that, that says, uh, you know, can I feed these spoiled strawberries to my chicken? Or can I, uh, uh, I have leftover uh, ribs, can I feed that to my chickens? And yes, chickens are omnivores, they'll eat most anything, but is that the best thing to feed them? Depending on what, on what we want, if we're trying to get eggs for sales, then that's probably not the best way to do things. Uh, feeding an appropriate formulated diet is really the best way to go. So as we're feeding uh, either commercial or small commercial uh, egg production flocks, our objective in feeding is healthy, highly productive birds. That's what we're aiming at. We're looking for maximum egg production that genetically they can produce. So if you're purchasing production birds, uh, from industry sources, and many of the production birds that we, we can purchase at hatcheries are eggs that are purchased from commercial sources. So if you didn't have them, they might be in a commercial operation somewhere. Uh, they have, many of those have the genetic potential for that. 
But if we're going to a, a hatchery and we're purchasing a Cornish, standard dark Cornish breed, or we're purchasing Japanese fowl or Old English game or one of the standard breeds, their production, their maximum production is going to be much lower than that of these commercial strains of birds. And so no matter what we feed them, we're not going to increase their egg production. They only have so much genetic potential. Uh, also, we're going to look at maximum conversion. Now, conversion is a way we measure efficiency uh, in feeding and production. So how much feed does it take to produce a dozen eggs, a pound of eggs, however you want to measure it? It's called feed conversion. They're converting feed into some product. It could be growth. It could be eggs, uh, depending upon what we want. Uh, and so the, the lower the number there, in other words, the least amount of feed that we can feed them to get the same product, that's going to be efficient in our production. And since feed is a major part of our cost, it makes sense to make sure that we have uh, feed, of, uh, or the feed conversion is going to, be, uh, going to be best based on the feed that we're going to provide them. And then we want high quality eggs. We want sound shells. We want uh, thick albumin uh, egg whites. We want uh, 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 yolks that are uh, the proper color and things of that nature. And feeds are going to play a huge role in those items in quality. So for egg production, we want healthy flocks. We want maximum egg production at the lowest amount of feed provided and the highest quality eggs. Uh, and, and that's really the, uh, the focus of the commercial industry, should be also the focus of the small producer. If we consider a typical hen uh, in a typical egg production unit, these, chi these chickens are working very hard metabolically. If we look at an average hen, the average hen lays 250 eggs in a year, uh, we're going to use that number approximately. Average commercial is going to be higher than that, probably closer to 270. But to make the math easy, let's use 250. Average weight of those eggs is about two ounces, approximately 56 to 60 grams per egg. So if we do a little math, we see 250 eggs in a year, each egg at two ounces. That means that she's producing 500 ounces of eggs on an annual basis. If we divide by 16 to get the number of pounds, that's 31 point and a quarter pounds of eggs per year. That hen weighs somewhere average around four pounds. The red hen's a little bit, little bit more, white leggard hen's a little less, but approximately four pounds. That means so, uh, uh, she's producing eight times her body weight in eggs on an annual basis. That's a lot of metabolic work that she's doing. And so to make that metabolic work more efficient, we need to feed them well. They aren't little robots, they're not machines, they're a biological unit that if we feed them well, then for the most part they will perform well, assuming they have the genetics and we're managing them properly. If we're not managing them properly, again, uh, no matter what we feed them, it's not going to be uh, uh, helpful. On the meat flocks, we have a different focus. We still want highly productive uh, flocks of birds and healthy birds, but now rather than egg production, we're interested in growth. We want a maximum growth rate. For efficiency purposes, we want to get them to weight as soon as we can. We want a good final body weight. We want uh, uh, economic efficiency. We want a lower amount of feed for each pound of feed that uh, they are consuming. So we have a different thought here in meat flocks. The birds are only around a short time, six, eight, 10 weeks, depending upon strain. Uh, and we want to maximize our return. To do that, we need to feed them to, to focus on these kinds of, uh, of results. If we look at broilers, this would be the Cornish cross type broiler. Uh, we look at those over the last several, years, last several decades. Since 1940, birds were about three pounds at market weight. Today, they're closer to seven pounds at market weight. Uh, even birds that I purchase here, we do research on, where we're not doing uh, feeding research, we're looking at environmental or some other uh, litter, uh, uh, litter type or something of that nature. 
from sack feed we purchase at the local feed store, we can get right at seven pounds out of them in six weeks. Uh, and that's pretty consistent with the kinds of feed that we purchase, just regular sack feed that anyone can purchase. But you can see how uh, genetics has played an important role in the development of the broiler chicken. We've uh, increased their, uh, their weights fairly dramatically, uh, more than doubled in size in, uh, in that period of time. And at the same time, the age at which they reach those weights has declined dramatically as well. And so in 1940, to get that three pound bird, it would take 12 weeks. Uh, by 2000, so just a little less than 20 years ago, uh, we could get those same, that same, uh, or that the six pound weight at, at uh, six weeks. So in half the time, we have twice as much poundage on those birds. Now over the last uh, 15 years or so, really the focus of industry has changed slightly where they're looking for more throughput in the plant. And so they're allowing the birds to get bigger. And to do that, they're allowing them to, to get a little bit, a uh, little more age to them. So rather than going at six weeks to keep a five pound or a five and a half pound bird, where we now, if we wanted five and a half pound market birds, we'd be processing them at five and a half weeks or five weeks. They're really too young for that. So we're going to six and a half weeks. We're getting seven, seven and a half pound birds through the plant. And that means that there's more uh, product to market. Along this same time, we really changed the focus in the way that we, uh, as consumers, buy chicken. Uh, back in the 1940s through the 80s, it was pretty much all whole body chickens in a package. Today, no, very few people know what to do with a whole body chicken. And so uh, we're more parts, and, and we've even given up parts now to mostly further processed product. Hot dogs, ham, uh, nuggets, patties, those kinds of things. And it's cheaper to produce those products with larger birds. It's cheaper to debone them and things of that nature. So it's, uh, it's moved to a larger size. Now on, on the small flock, you're primarily uh, selling whole bodies. And so, uh, and so some of that doesn't, uh, doesn't really affect the small producer, but realizing that, that they grow much faster than they used to. And then at the same time, conversion, the amount of weight they get per feed, per the amount of feed that they're, uh, they're bringing in, is you can see a dramatic uh, decline there as well. So where in the 1940s, the feed conversion was about four pounds of feed per pound of bird live weight. And so that three pound bird would take 12 pounds of feed to get it to three pounds. Uh, today, we have a, a seven pound bird and we can do that in about the same amount of feed. So we're down from four, four uh, a feed conversion down to nearly 1.5, about 1.6, 1.65 feed conversion would be about average. So <clears throat> for every pound of bird, it takes about 1.6 pounds of feed. Um, uh, and that's really of our traditional livestock species. Uh, broilers are the uh, are the most efficient in growth, uh, as from these numbers as these numbers represent. Now, if we move past the commercial of the eggs and meat purposes, chickens are raised for other reasons as well. And so, recreation kinds of flocks, where you have uh, standard breeds or what we might call exotic or fancy breeds. Uh, we're looking primarily for healthy birds. We're looking for standard appearance. So we're looking for specific weights. We're looking for feather appearance. We're looking for feather uh, condition. Uh, and so we're going to feed them a little differently. Maximum growth and maximum egg number is not necessarily important. It's certainly a benefit, but it's not necessarily important uh, for, uh, for producers uh, to, uh, to maximize that. If you're, you have down on the right, corner you have a Polish. Well, a Polish is never going to be big size for eating purposes. It doesn't lay very many eggs and the eggs are quite small than it does lay. And so they're not particularly good choice for, uh, uh, for meat or egg production. But for their appearance and for raising fancy birds, uh, they are a, a common bird for that purpose. And then we can even focus in on some of the other species of birds, game birds and waterfowl, uh, pheasants, partridges, quail, uh, ducks and geese which some of these that are seen here are, uh, are poultry, the waterfowl are poultry, the rest of those, the pheasants and partridges and quail are not technically poultry, 
uh, by definition, but they're very similar to chickens. We would feed them differently because they're now a different species. They have different requirements. They're similar, but they generally require higher proteins, particularly the upland birds, not so much on the waterfowl, uh, but they do take different formulations of similar feeds to maximize their potential. In addition to that, we don't have the same genetic backgrounds that we do in chickens. They haven't been selected to the same level, so we don't have these uh, highly productive animals like we do in poultry, in chickens, uh, to, uh, to do the same kinds of productions. So objectives here in our feeding program would be for meat birds. We're looking at young, rapidly growing birds. And then we also, that would be fryer chickens, and then roasters or turkeys are a little more longer lived. They're going to be around a few more weeks. And so we're looking at a longer growing stage. So growth is going to slow on a, on a daily basis. A daily gain is going to slow down a little bit as the birds get older. And so we take that into account in the way we feed them. So we're going to feed them a little differently if we want them to go out uh, 12 or 15 weeks as opposed to if they're going to be marketed at six or seven weeks. It just depends on the, where, where we know they're going. Egg production birds, we're starting with baby chicks. We're going to grow them to adulthood through their juvenile years. We're going to get them into production. So we want to have a sustained, moderate growth. We don't want to put the pounds on early. We don't need to. We simply want to sustain their growth so they end up as a well-developed uh, uh, production hen uh, for, uh, for egg laying purposes. And then once they're grown and they're in their full egg production, we want to simply maximize their egg production. So we're going to feed them so that they can maintain their body weight and keep, that, uh, keep egg produ uh, production at a high level. Remember, they're doing all this hard work. Uh, 30 pounds or more of eggs per year, so we have to feed them to reflect that. The recreation birds, we're simply growing them to follow a standard breed, and so the, the standard will tell you what size they're supposed to be, how what they're supposed to look like, those kinds of things, and so we're looking to follow some growth pattern that is a part of the standard. We don't want them to get too big, and we don't want them too small. We want proper feather development, so we want the feathers to look good because that's what we're doing with exhibition birds. We're looking at their body type, but also their feather condition. Um, uh, egg production should be good, but not necessarily maximum. We don't need every possible egg out of them because that's not what we're raising them for. And certainly we're going to keep them generally around for a much longer period of time, and so health into advanced age is going to be helpful as well. So. Again, good feed is going to help us do that. Game birds and waterfowl is a whole series of possibilities, simply proper growth and egg production for the species we have. Some are gonna lay much better than others uh, in, the, in that respect. And so we're going to feed them. Typically they require higher protein levels and a little more attention to some of the feed rather than, than chicken feed. Now, uh, we, will they survive on chicken feed? Yes, will they perform at their maximum? Probably not. And so we need to have different formulas uh, based on their species. And so a few basic points when we're talking about uh, feeding poultry. First of all, their biology. Uh, their biology is such that they are a simple stomach or a monogastric animal. Monogastric means they are uh, uh, animals that are, have a stomach similar, a digestive system that's similar to our own. Uh, and, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, and so they're not little cows, and so they're not little sheep. Uh, they have a totally different digestive system. Uh, they're more similar to ours than it is to sheep or goats or, or cattle. Their nutrition, we have some requirements as well. We've got to think about ingredients versus nutrients. We're feeding protein, but we're getting the protein into them by feeding corn and soybean or some other kind of ingredient. We have to take that into account. They need a balanced diet. And a balanced diet means all of the nutrients are there, uh, essentially all at the same time, um, and we will talk about that in a minute. High protein is what we require as a monogastric. They need higher protein than, say, a ruminant, uh, because a ruminant has, uh, has microbial, uh, uh, um, a rumen full of microbes that really help them with that process, 
and they need low fiber as opposed to the ruminant that needs high fiber. We want low fiber and generally something less than 5%. Uh, and we need the amino acids as at a proper level. I'll say several times uh, this evening that chickens don't have a protein requirement. They have amino acid requirements and amino acids make up the proteins. And so, uh, so there isn't anything magical about 16% protein. Uh, it's how, what, what the level of the amino acids are that uh, make up that protein that's important. And then we use what's called a phase feeding uh, process, which is a phase of life. We feed young birds differently than we feed older birds. And so those are the, uh, a couple of the points we need to think about. The digestive system of a chicken, uh, it's pretty simple. It's relatively short compared to a mammal of the same weight. And so they're uh, a, quite a simple system. And they have mouth parts was in the form of a beak and all birds uh, have some kind of a beak or bill. Uh, and uh, which means they don't have any teeth and so they kind of swallow everything whole. And they can tear it up a little bit. They can, they can step on it and they can pull it apart. Then they'll try to do that. But they have a pretty big esophagus and they can swallow fairly large uh, pieces of, of, of food, uh, they're going to go down the esophagus and it's going to be stored in the crop. Crop is an organ that birds have. Uh, we don't have that. Our storage is done in the stomach. Their storage is done in the crop. Uh, they don't have any storage in there, what would be considered their stomach, which we've the proventriculus in this picture. Uh, that's the glandular stomach. That's where hydrochloric acid is, uh, is secreted and helps the digestive process. But the, uh, the, the feed, the gorge, they'll pick up all their feed and they will then store it in their crop and slowly release it into, down into the digestive system. We'll go first into the proventriculus where there's no storage. It's pretty much just a wide spot with cells that secrete hydrochloric acid. Then it goes into their gizzard where it'll grind up. The gizzard is a muscular organ that acts as the teeth of the bird. It will grind the feed into small particle sizes. If you're feeding a mash or a pelleted diet, then the gizzard really doesn't do very much because the feed is already ground to a fairly uh, fine consistency. If they're being fed whole grains or they're, being, uh, they're consuming out of the pasture insects with hard, a hard carapace or a, a exoskeleton, then they need the gizzard to grind that up so that they can digest it. Once it's a small enough particle size, and they will eat little stones that they will, they will store in the gizzard for this purpose. Uh, once it's ground into small as a particle size, it will start moving into the small intestine. First into the loop, that loop there is the duodenal loop, and that contains the pancreas, where uh, digestive enzymes are secreted, dumped into the system so that all of those uh, uh, ingredients can be broken down into their constituent nutrients and those uh, nutrients can then cross the membrane from the small intestine into the bloodstream. And throughout the small intestine, that will occur. When we get down to, towards the end where you see those two little wings that are coming off, it's called the cica. Uh, birds have, well, chickens have paired cica. Cica is quite variable in different species of birds. Uh, but chickens and most of the birds we deal with uh, here in poultry uh, are, have paired cica. And a chicken, they're about the size of a pencil or so, they're paired. Uh, it's analogous to our, uh, our appendix, a uh, human appendix. Um, it has uh, some function as a immune organ, as well as for some, uh, uh, some uh, fermentation goes on. Some of the fiber gets in there and ferments with bacterial uh, action. They can be removed without affecting the nutritional, uh, the, the biology of the hen at all. And so uh, they're, they're there, they're important, uh, but they can be done without. Uh, at the junction where the, the esophagus or the uh, small intestine reaches the level of the cica is where the small intestine changes to the large intestine. Large intestine in a chicken is quite short, only a couple of inches or so. Its main function is to simply pull back water. And so the water then is resorbed. So when they uh, defecate, uh, chicken droppings generally are relatively dry. Uh, if they're eating certain things, then they might be a little uh, wetter, but Typically, they're drier than that of a mammal. Uh, and, uh, and then also the white cap on the dropping, that comes from the kidneys. So that's, uh, that's the uh, cleaning of the blood, where in a mammal, that's urine. In a bird, that's uric acid. And that's what the white part is in the dropping. 
the balanced diet? Well, here are the nutrients. Uh, I like to add water as a nutrient, even though technically it's not, uh, but it's consumed at a higher rate than all the other nutrients combined. If we were to measure feed and water uh, intake in chickens that are under normal temperature, say a nice spring day where it's 75 degrees outside, uh, chickens will consume about twice as much water as they'll eat in feed by weight. So for every pound of feed, they'll drink two pounds of water. If it gets hot, then that water consumption goes up significantly. So when it's 100 degrees and they're in the in the Central Valley, uh, in the Davis area, oftentimes it gets up in the 105, 110 range. I remember those days from my, my time at Davis, uh, that water consumption will quadruple or even more. They're gonna drink uh, mostly water and eat very little feed under those conditions. The others, the carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, minerals, these are all technically the nutrients. And so we're going to have to balance these, we want to formulate a diet where these are balanced based on the requirement of the bird. The requirements are given to us in this uh, form. This is the nutrient requirements of poultry. Uh, the 1994 edition put out by the National Research Council of the, Ameri of the National Academy of Science. This is old. This is 25 years old and I was, I know that it's in process of being renewed and interestingly as I was looking online to see when it's supposed to come out, as far as I could tell, it should come out the end of this year, so 2019. And interestingly, one of the chairman of the committee that's uh, putting this uh, book together is uh, Dr. Kirk Clazing, who's a professor of animal science there at UC Davis. I remember he was a young professor when I was there as a graduate student, so uh, I have a bit of connection there. Anyway, uh, they will review all of the research on nutrition, all of the modern uh, research, and look at all of the nutrients. So on the left side of this column of uh, numbers are all the nutrients. You have the amino acids, you have the uh, uh, fat, you have the nutrient, uh, the uh, uh, minerals, you have at the bottom, you have all the vitamins. And so all of those need to be at some level. And those are the levels that the research tells us are required by uh, uh, chickens. And so you look at this as layer chickens based on what they're eating. So at the top of the thing, you see 80, 100, or 120. That's how many grams a day they're eating. And those are the requirements. These are pretty old. The chicken has changed pretty dramatically in the last uh, 25 years. And so I suspect some of these numbers will be quite a bit different when the new version of this book comes out. But this is what we have. And so here's what we still use when we formulate diet. To get those nutrients, we need to use ingredients. So the nutrients are there, uh, protein, vitamins, fats, carbohydrates, those are typically the nutrients. But we don't feed uh, typically nutrients directly. We feed them in the form of an ingredient, grains, cereal grains or legume grains. So uh, corn, oats, barley, soybean, canola, um, any of those things can be used as a feed ingredient most of those ingredients contain multiple nutrients. And so it's the job of the nutritionist in formulating the diet to understand what all of the nutrients are found in the ingredients, formulate a diet so everything is at a level that's at the appropriate level for that particular species. One of the problems is there are some ingredients that are problematic. They have compounds in them that are incompatible for, uh, for chickens. One of those is cottonseed meal. Now, California used to be a big grower of cotton, not so much anymore, uh, but uh, so cottonseed was quite available here on the West Coast. It's used often in the dairy industry as a protein supplement, fed to dairy cows. Uh, in chickens, uh, it has a compound in it called gossypol that causes discoloring of the yolks. Oftentimes they turn kind of a grayish green color if fed high levels of cottonseed. So we really can't use that in uh, layer diets uh, to any great extent. Canola. Canola is, uh, is a, 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 a brassica type plant. It's like mustard. Uh, it's a high uh, protein uh, grain, uh, not really grain, it's, it's a, a brassica type. So it means it's in the family with cabbages and turnips and things of this nature. And so it has a lot of uh, aromatic compounds in it. 
the seed of this, which is called rape seed, it's called canola because they have uh, done some selection to remove a toxic oil from it. Uh, and if you feed that to brown layers, you tend to get uh, odd or fishy tasting eggs uh, from, uh, from those because of a compound called sinapin that's high in, cano in canola. Uh, and uh, Rhode Island red type chickens, which are most of our brown egg layers are based off of, have a mutation uh, they lack an enzyme to break down the, the compound that's, uh, that's, that's synthesized by the cinnamon, uh, and which causes fishy smelling eggs. So sometimes if you feed canola to uh, brown egg layers, you will get a very dramatic fishy odor, and that's from the canola. Also, uh, we've done research here, and research has been done for many years on beans, so like red beans, kidney beans, uh, pinto beans, those kinds of things. Uh, just like in humans, they cause gas, they cause uh, digestion problems in chickens. They simply do not grow uh, at all when fed. Uh, we did some experiments where the birds are about half the size when about 30% bean meal was used in their feed. So most of uh, poultry feed is comprised of grains, either cereals, grains, so this would be corn, oats, barley, wheat, uh, are used for the energy source for calories and that's in the form of a starch, or legumes, this would be soybean, uh, um, soybean or peas or something else of this nature, and that's used as a protein source, typically in, uh, in today's uh, modern poultry feed uh, uh, production. And so those are our primary uh, uh, ingredients. When we're looking for uh, chickens, we're looking at, uh, at protein levels anywhere from 12 to 23%. 12 would be a maintenance diet for non-laying chickens or for roosters. 23% is really for uh, baby uh, um, young broader chicks, so for fast growth rate. Turkeys, we can still have low for, for maintenance birds, but uh, much higher for the young birds and game birds even higher yet for maximum growth rate. We feed them chicken starter, they'll survive, but they're not going to thrive. They're not going to get to the proper weight. Uh, you know, if we feed 28% uh, protein turkey starter to chickens, they're not gonna grow a whole lot faster and get a whole lot bigger uh, because the 23% the is really where the threshold is. We don't get any advantage for feeding that higher protein to any great extent. And then we want a lower fiber, uh, so we want less than 5% fiber, just like in our, our diets. If we get too much fiber in our diet, we get sometimes digestive problems, uh, and chickens are no different. So we want to keep the fiber relatively low. The fiber is coming from the grains, the coating on the grains, the, any hulls, that kind of thing in grain, uh, any stalks, uh, the woody parts of plants is really where the fiber is coming from. Uh, now, as I said before, chickens don't have a protein requirement. They have amino acid requirements. And so it's the amino acids that are important. And here is a, a, a list of the amino acids that are important. We have about 20 that make up uh, most of the protein that we're going to see uh, in, in, in nature. Uh, the amino acids are broken into two groups, the essentials. Now, essential amino acid means it's required in the diet where the non-essentials, the birds can synthesize them. And so we don't really have to worry about those. If they lack alanine, they will simply synthesize it. But when they're making protein, they're breaking down plant proteins and making egg albumin, which is mostly protein and water. When they're making the protein for egg white and they're lacking alanine, they will simply, uh, they will simply synthesize more to make up the egg protein. If they're missing any on the left column, the arginine, cysteine, histidine, etc., then they have to have that in the diet. Uh, so that has to be in the feed. Now I've got some arrows that say very important to some of those. The thicker arrows, methionine and lysine, uh, where methionine is virtually always limiting in normal diets for poultry, which means it's low. The threshold isn't reached under normal corn soy type diets. Lysine can be, and it sometimes is a problem. The other two with the smaller arrows, the thinner arrows, they uh, generally are okay and are usually not a threshold, but we can use those in synthetic form to reduce the overall protein in the diet. So we're, there's a lot of work in industry to 
play with uh, how we formulate diets to reduce the protein content. We reduce the total protein content. That reduces the amount of nitrogen coming out of the back end of the chicken, which means we have less manure problems to deal with. Um, but important to small flock producers is the methionine. Methionine is typically limiting. And so in virtually all poultry diets, some synthetic methionine is added to make up that uh, loss in threshold. If we don't do that, then growth rates are depressed and egg sizes tend to be small. And so we need to make sure uh, that, we, uh, that we maintain those, uh, uh, those uh, amino acids uh, in, that, in that way. Now, if we're feeding organic diets, now organic disallows synthetic compounds in diets. If we have uh, lack synthetic compounds, that means we can't add methionine, except there is a variance. All organic diets, at least USDA uh, organic, uh, the uh, National Organic Standard allows for two tons of uh, two pounds of per ton of methionine added. This is synthetic, uh, and in turkey diets, three pounds per ton. The others can't be added to any amount, but only methionine. If they didn't allow that variance, then organic diets would really not support maximum growth and maximum egg production in, uh, in chickens. Uh, the eggs would be few and they would be small because they can't make enough protein to make the eggs large or lay lots of eggs. Uh, there are a few, uh, a few kinds of uh, uh, ingredients that have higher methionine, but they're difficult to get. Sesame meal, um, uh, sunflower meal, millet, things of that nature tend to be high in methionine, but they're not particularly practical in, uh, in poultry diet. And so when we balance, and balancing uh, amino acids, balancing the diet, we need to add various ingredients. Here's an example. You can see soybean meal, which the, the dotted line is the requirements. So that's the threshold. We have to have at least that much for maximum growth rate. So you can see soybean, even though it's very high in protein, tends to be limiting in methionine. It's too low. So we have to find another ingredient that would be high in methionine. And in this example, we use sesame meal, which is high in methionine. So you mix the two together at the proper amounts, we can end up with a, a diet that has the proper threshold of uh, methionine. Now, since, uh, since sesame meal is difficult to get, in, in non-organic diets, we add upwards of three or three and a half percent methionine to make up that difference. You can make up some of the difference in organic diets, but not all of the difference. So oftentimes, organic diets do not support maximum growth or egg production simply because there's, uh, there's not enough methionine uh, in there. And there's been a lot of research done trying to find ingredients that can be used to uh, provide natural uh, methionine. And in 20 years since organic standard came out, that still hasn't been identified. And then phase feeding is a proper, uh, is a, uh, a, a, a process by which we, we feed based on age or productive status. And that's why when you go to the feed store and you buy uh, poultry feed, it's called starter. It could be called a grower developer. Oftentimes the starter and grower now are mixed together. And so you buy a, an all-purpose kind of a, of a feed. And that's just because it's easier to market that way. It's best if you have a starter, a grower, and then a finisher for our meat birds. If we look at the commercial uh, roller industry, they feed in the six or seven weeks the birds are growing before processing. They often will feed between six and seven different feed stuffs. Two uh, pre-start, start one, start two, grower one, grower two, finisher. Uh, and they'll feed it to them only for a few days to, to focus and directly uh, what they require as opposed to overfeeding or underfeeding. Layer diet for egg, for egg laying birds, breeder diet for those that are we're gonna hatch eggs, has a little more vitamins in it, and then a maintenance diet for non-producing hens or roosters uh, is, is really all they need. We're overfeeding them if we feed them anything else. And so we use this, it makes it easy for the, the consumer, the producer, to buy feed, you just go and buy a sack of starter or buy a sack of layer, uh, and that works well. It's formulated specifically for the requirements of uh, laying or growing birds. These would be considered feed supplements, so scratch grains. This is just usually a mixture of cracked corn and wheat. Uh, think of it as candy for chickens. 
and, and they should not be fed supplements. Give a little bit a treat, get them to get out of the chicken house and go out and scratch around on the ground, but it's not a prepared diet. It's not a balanced diet. Oyster shell will help uh, increase their calcium intake. The layer diet should have enough calcium, but in older hens, when the shell quality begins to decline, the, the shells feel a little sandpapery or something, sometimes oyster shell is going to, uh, going to help with thickness of shell. But remember, much of that decline is not necessarily dietary, it's simply age-related and the shells, as the egg gets bigger, the shells get thinner, uh, and older hens tend to lay bigger eggs. And so this is a biology issue, not necessarily all, uh, all oyster shell. You can help with it, but it's not going to completely fix the problem. Grit uh, is simply for, uh, for uh, uh, grinding, and so they'll eat some of that, but they'll find that on the ground if they're pasturing. And then the whole grains, uh, table scraps, uh, and the pasture could be considered supplements as well. These all need to be used uh, judiciously. Um, I always basically say what they'll clean up in 10 or 15 minutes is all you want to give them during the day, or we're going to start moving into that balanced diet and we're going to throw it out. Feed texture, uh, whether it's a pellet, a mash, or a crumble, it really doesn't matter. It's simply the texture. Typically, we feed layers in the commercial industry mash, and we feed broilers pellets for specific reasons. Uh, you can't really purchase mash very easily anymore. Everything's pelletized, uh, which, is, which is fine. Fermented feeds, or what we call wet mash, uh, which has been used for years, and now it's been uh, incorporated into what they call fermented feeds, is simply a, a way to uh, soften it. It pre-digests it. The bacteria will break it down a little bit. And as the bird consumes it, there will be uh, some benefit there. Reduced feed cost is minimal. It's a little bit, but not much. Considering the amount of effort it takes to make this, if you're, doing with, if you're making this for lots of birds, it's a difficult process. It's hard to feed because it's wet and things of that nature. But uh, there is a little bit of advantage, but not to, not to take into account a lot of the cost of, um, of actually doing it. Just to give you a few of the typical grains, here are corn, soy, wheat, barley, canola, uh, things of that nature. A few of the others uh, that are used, uh, triticales here in the Northwest. Uh, we see a lot of triticale uh, oats. We just did some work with a hullless oats uh, on layer chickens, seem to work well. Uh, legume grains uh, and uh, field peas can also be used. Some fairly exotic kinds of things that are being played with. Uh, teff, millet, amaranth, and quinoa uh, all have potential, but are not used to any great extent. Uh, in now, there are some of these ingredients that can be problematic. We talked about cottonseed and canola already. Uh, wheat and barley, if they're fed in high levels, can have digestive problems. It gets it's full of uh, uh, glucans, which make things sticky, so the birds tend to eat more, drink more water, and then they get the runs. And so it can be problematic there. Oats, unless they're a hullless oat, tend to have too much fiber because the hull sticks to it. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't come off like it does in wheat. Flax is good for omega-3 fatty acids, but it's, uh, it tends to uh, cause fishy odors. If you get it up past 6 or 8% in the diet, it tends to give odors. Rye gives digestive problems. And there are toxins in both camelina and sorghum milos. They have tannins and other toxins in them. Uh, and so some of these ingredients, while they're available, are not used to any great extent because they have these anti-nutritional factors. Different species require different formulations of essentially the same ingredients. So they'll have more or less the same requirements in different formulations. The same ingredients can be used for some of these types. So how do we determine? Well, you have to determine if they're available. Uh, can you get them or are they seasonal? Uh, and what quantities? So if you're at a large producer like a Foster Farms, they need to have access to uh, train car loads on a regular basis. If you're only growing 100 birds and you're buying two, three, 400 pounds at a time, then something uh, of these exotic types might be able to be used. They could be variable. You might not be able to get them year to year. Uh, their nutritional quality may be variable based on production uh, schemes. You have to kind of do some testing. Um, how far are they coming? Are they being shipped? And so that increases the cost. 
Uh, and then do they have any non-nutritional factors that are going to cause them to be problems? Here are some of those. I won't go into them in any detail, but uh, there are some uh, things, proteinase inhibitors, lectins, tannins, phytates, non-parched starch polysaccharides. These are all found in, in various grains of various levels. All of them have them. Corn tends to have the least amount, and that's why it's used uh, the most, uh, as well as other reasons. And, uh, and some are just so problematic that they're not used at all because they have these kinds of problems with them. Poultry feeding, like I said, a major cost. Uh, and then organic diets are even more. So let's take a look at organic. You must be fed organic certified feeds, uh, and they must be fed from day two. So, uh, so organic chickens, you can buy them from commercial sources. They need to be fed a certified organic feed. So organic feeds, were, the, really the nutrition isn't affected. It's there's possible, uh, the, what they're concerned about are residues of either chemical fertilizers or pesticides that would be in the feed. And that's what organic diets are, uh, are really designed for that purpose. You can't add synthetics except for vitamins. Those are synthetic. And you can add amino acids only in the form of methionine at two pounds per ton and three pounds per ton for turkeys. Uh, nothing else synthetic can be added. There are lists of compounds that you can add and lists that you can't add in certified organic diets. And so that's heavily regulated if you label organic. I put in here, this is a, a, a actually, I, uh, um, I kind of modified this from a publication from, uh, from Galera Davis from the Avian Science Department many years ago and just kind of uh, modified it a little bit. But this is a generalized diet. So if, if anybody wants to make their own diets, here's a possible uh, option. Uh, they're not going to necessarily thrive. Uh, but it will keep them alive and they will lay eggs. Are they going to lay at maximum level? Probably not uh, because you're, you've got all these variable possibilities, soybean, peanut meal, uh, cottonseed, uh, low gossipol and low amounts of it, uh, sunflower meal, etc. But you can't, uh, uh, your, your accuracy is quite limited when you have all these uh, ingredients, but it will, it will suffice under small kinds of conditions. I don't, we're running out of time. And so uh, uh, as far as diet formulation, typically this is done uh, at the feed mill, but with the help of a nutritionist, they're going to look at what's required, uh, what's in the grains, and they're going to go through a, a computer process to determine the least cost formulation. You buy feed in a sack, that generally is reformulated on a weekly basis based on the price of the ingredients they can get. So the ingredients may change. So if you look at the label, it will say grains, and it will give you a list. Well, that doesn't mean necessarily they're all in there, but some of them are in there and some of them aren't. But the next time you get it, it might be a different mix because it's based on the price at the time. They're going to use that same information we got before from the, uh, the uh, nutrient requirements of poultry, both broilers and egg production. So that's where the numbers come from. Then they're going to look at the ingredients. How much do they cost? Are they available? Can they be used? Are they palatable? Chickens don't like rye very well, and so we probably don't use rye. Are there toxins? So there are some compounds that are that way. Do they have digestive problems? Do we need to add enzyme to the diet? All of those will take into account. Then we're going to put it in the computer, and it's going to determine what the diet would be. And it's going to give us a, uh, over on the left side at the top, it gives you an amount, how much you're going to put in per thousand pounds, what the ingredient is, what's the percent of the mix. Uh, and then at the bottom, it'll give you the, uh, the ingredient level or the nutrient levels. And so you can see what's there to make sure everything works out well. There are some programs that are very, uh, very uh, precise, that are very expensive to purchase. There are others that are, you can get on freebies on, uh, online but there's a lot of uh, hit and miss. So you've got to kind of add it and see what happens and then change things around. So it takes a while to formulate using those kinds of systems. Here's a couple of practical diets. Uh, this was from Salatin's uh, book on pastured poultry. Uh, and you can see he used cornmeal and peanut meal. Of course, he's in Virginia, so peanut meal is easy to get. Not so easy for us out here. Uses uh, soybean, SBOM is soybean oil meal. And so that's soybean. And you can see a whole series of, of products added 
uh, the, the wet diet is, is similar, only different. It uses triticale, which is uh, wheat and rye uh, crossed, and soybean, a little bit of alfalfa. And so you can formulate them any way you want, as long as the numbers end up. Uh, we're going to use phase feeding is, again, meets the nutrients of the bird, and then meal feeding. If you say meal feeding, that means we're going to feed them various times during the day. That's a different process. Um, uh, here's just some uh, numbers uh, that you can uh, purchase for, for, uh, or, or use for chickens, starter, grower, and there's some protein levels. And that's typically what we look at uh, is protein. But remember that protein means that's the, the minimum amount of protein to re have all the amino acids where they need to be. And so that's uh, essentially what that all means. And so this is gonna be variable. We've already talked about phase feeding a little bit. We've already seen this, uh, more or less this slide. Um, typically today, start grow diets are going to be at around 19%. And so you feed the same diet for broilers throughout life and then up to 17 weeks for layers and then switch to a layer. So it's, it makes it easy for uh, producers. There's some uh, phase feeding for turkeys. Uh, again, higher protein to start with and higher protein throughout. They simply require a higher protein for maximum growth. And so you need to use turkey feed uh, when feeding turkeys. Um, and, uh, and this is a uh, type of meal feeding, which typically we don't do very much in small flocks. I just wanted to talk about uh, a wet mash, and, and here's the last couple of slides. Uh, pasture in poultry feeding, uh, remember, uh, we like to put them out on pasture, and it's a management tool, uh, but they're not really getting much from the pasture grass. The benefits of a pasture are insects and seeds. And so when producers ask me what kind of uh, pasture grass or pasture should I produce, I say what draws the most insects uh, because that's really what you need uh, because that's what they're getting out of that mostly. They're going to eat a little bit of grass but they don't get much nutrition from grass. So when you do that you want to uh, plant a mixture of grasses, maybe some legumes, maybe some broadleaf kinds of things, some succulents so that they have a variable uh, pasture. They'll eat some of it but they're mostly looking for seeds and insects. And of course, the seeds and insects are gone part of the year. This is my own pasture in my backyard. I have a few acres. And so here is the, the pastures in, in uh, Willamette Valley of Oregon. The marsh you can see is all wet, so there's really not much there. In May, we have uh, good pastures, but then by September, everything has died back. And so there really is very little there. So for a few months out of the year, you'll have a pasture. That green pasture will support lots of insects. At the end of, the, of that, you'll get some uh, seeds produced by the grasses. Uh, but by September, pretty much the insects are, some of the insects are still there, but uh, most of the seeds are gone uh, and it's not gonna support. So if you're thinking of feeding, don't use the pasture as a feedstuff. Feed them as if they weren't on pasture and they will be much better. Lastly, fermented feeds, uh, we're going to soak it in uh, to allow some fermentation to occur. Um, and, uh, and we're essentially uh, increasing lactic acid bacteria and acetic acid bacteria. It's going to have some odor to it. Uh, and, uh, and it's going to look like that day one, two, and three. You're getting some bacterial action. There was a, a, one research project I could find. Here's what happened. Uh, they it reduced the dry matter intake. In other words, they reduced their feed consumption. Their feed con uh, conversion went up a little bit, but it may be unacceptable after a few hours. The birds won't eat it after a while. It, it gets past some level of fermentation, they'll no longer consume it. It tended, in their research, it tended to increase uh, aggressiveness and cause poor feathering. Uh, it reduced their natural foraging behavior. They didn't go out and, and forage like they used to. Uh, because of the calcium that's in the feed that uh, went to the bottom because it uh, started soaking, um, they uh, lost some of the calcium. So you have to have oyster shell available uh, or mix it during the fermentation process to bring the calcium back up. Um, it also increased availability of uh, phytate phosphorus, increases some other things, um, increases egg weight, but reduced egg mass. So what does that mean? It means that we got uh, bigger eggs, but fewer eggs, essentially what that means. Uh, and then uh, it increased their body weight. And so fermented feeds can be used. Uh, there's a lot of work involved. 
Uh, but uh, it's again, it's not the panacea. It's not going to fix everything. It's just another method that can be used. And I would be happy to answer questions. I think I'm just about out of time. Thank you, Dr. Hermes. Yes. Um, Todd, do we have any questions? Do we, any, do we want to start with in the room? Yeah, we can start with in the room. Any questions from any folks in the room? I wanted to ask about the nutritional needs during their molting time. Uh, good question. Did you hear that, Dr. Hermes? Yes. Uh, simply an adequate formulated diet. What they really need is, uh, is high levels of zinc, zinc in the diet. The mineral zinc is good for, for skin and the feathers and hair. That's why if you have dander shampoo, it often has zinc in it. It's very good for that. And so a properly formulated diet, uh, as long as it's, it's formulated and it's got the proper vitamins, should be adequate for, uh, for that condition, for molting purposes. If you want, you can supplement them during the molt with a little bit of vitamins in the water, and I help, but certainly uh, they should have the feed in, the, or the, the right nutrients in the prepared feed. So just to follow up on that question, so what do you suggest to some of these smaller producers that have you know, 20, 50, 100 birds? What are their options as far as a, a ration for molting? It, 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 does, it seems kind of challenging to work with a feed mill when you're that small. And I don't really see molting diets at most feed stores. Yeah, you're not going to really find a molting diet. So uh, while they're molting, these are uh, assuming adult birds that are in molt, uh, continue to feed them a uh, later ration um, because that's going to be formulated for uh, all of their needs. If you have something that would be considered a maintenance ration, which te technically means it would be lower in protein. So typically in molt, uh, now chickens are a little different than wild birds. Wild birds, they will uh, raise young and they will molt after they're all done in reproduction. They go to molt. Chickens really don't do that very well. They will molt even while they're laying eggs. Uh, because they're domesticated, they don't respond to the same to the same level in many cases that wild birds do, unless we go through a molting program, which most small flock producers aren't going to do. Commercial producers that are molting are gonna do that. Some don't molt anymore. Uh, but uh, so any prepared diet specifically designed for uh, laying birds or adult birds is should be adequate as a molt diet. There isn't anything special that they need for molting because what they do is they go, generally when they're in full molt, they're going to go out of egg production and so they put their energy resources and their feed resources into growing feathers rather than producing eggs. But chickens don't always follow the rules. Uh, and sometimes uh, they're in production as well as molting at the same time. And oftentimes during the year, they don't go through a full molt. They'll go through half a molt, and then they'll wait till the next year and molt the rest of the way. So they're sometimes quite variable compared to wild birds. Thank you. Any other questions from in the room? You yeah, know, we had uh, Pam ask, how does the gizzard deal with the acid from the stomach? Uh, the gizzard has a lining. It's called coilin. Um, it's a yellow material that is removed commercially when you process the giblets in the, in the bird. That's part of the giblet package, the liver, the heart, and the gizzard. They will remove it. It's yellow in color. And if you were to try to chew it, it would be like eating an inner tube. Very tough material called coilin. It's made out of, it's proteinaceous in nature. It protects the lining of the, of the, uh, gizzard so that when it's grinding and it has stones in in the gizzard and it's grinding and that's a very powerful muscle it's said that the gizzard of a turkey can break black walnuts and macadamia nuts because of its very powerful kind of a uh, of a muscle and when you put the stones in there it would just erode the lining away well this coilin grows uh is secreted and it protects the lining of the gizzard uh, so that protects it from the acid as well. 
Thank you. So uh, Patrick had asked, do you see much advantage to producers feeding sprouted grains as part of the diet? There has not been a lot of work on sprouted grains. The advantage is um, that the, there is active, as, this is what the thought is, there is active enzymes because it's now growing rather than a pea which is in, uh, uh, in some quiescent state sitting there. It's still technically alive, uh, but uh, not metabolizing. But when it's, as soon as metabolism begins, there's a whole whole uh, concert of enzymes that show up. We tried doing some work with, uh, with sprouted grains. The problem was it was difficult to measure. And we used peas, we were, and, and we were using it with, with all about uh, three-week-old broilers. And during that process, just before, as it's sprouting, the uh, the pea swells up so big that the, the small birds couldn't consume the whole pea. So we had to put it through a food processor and kind of grind it up a little bit—not grind it, but just break it into smaller pieces. Uh, it was very cumbersome to do. Uh, there may be an advantage, but remember, when it's sprouted, the bulk of the weight is water. Dry matter is essentially the same as when it went before it went into the water. The only thing that's different is there may be some active enzymes that may have some some birds. There hasn't been a lot of research on that, so we really don't know uh, if there's any specific effect or not. There's nothing wrong with it, but there's no way of knowing if it's there's any significant effect. So Sheila asks, is runny poo something to worry about? And let me add on a question there. Can you talk about interpreting sequel droppings versus the standard intestinal droppings? Sequel droppings are, fer are fermented uh, droppings. They tend to be black and tarry and tend to have a lot more odor. And it really depends on what they're being fed as to how much of that there will be. So on a necessarily a daily basis, they don't evacuate the cica. That might be once every couple of days where you might see a cecal dropping. Uh, there's really, uh, I, I'm not sure what the question is, how do you interpret that? It simply usually has something to do with diet. There's more fiber in the diet so that they're fermenting more. And Karen is asking, what about nuts in the diet? Ignoring costs, has there been any research on using nuts in poultry diets, and are there any nuts specifically contraindicated for poultry? We don't know of any that are contraindicated. We tried to do some work here with hazelnuts, because, of course, Oregon is a big hazelnut producing area. Um, and we did some pig work, but uh, we had a problem with the... Uh, with the poultry work, um, and so we never completed that project. One of the problems with nuts is you have to realize that nuts are full of fat. There's lots of oil in nuts. It's interesting as I was, uh, we have a small uh, hammer mill grinder, and when you grind hazel, it just turns into peanut butter. Uh, and so it's hard to, to work with. But there's no reason it wouldn't be, it'd be good if, as long as we take into account that it has a lot of fat which is okay, uh, but we have to take that into account in the formulation, that there's a lot more energy in the feed, there's more calories in the feed because we've got a lot of fat. Uh, but there's also significant protein in nuts too, so there simply could be an advantage. I'm not sure that a lot of that's been done. If it's been done, it's been peanut meal, and peanut meal is used in the, in the Southeast because they have access to it, uh, and it's just formulated in like any other, any other uh, in what's in the ingredient. And Dr. Hermes, I've seen some, some publications on um, amino acid breakdowns for some nuts, and I know that um, Brazil nuts, especially for methionine and lysine, are pretty high. But like you said, yeah, there's a, there's a lipid consideration there, obviously, and, uh, and, and on some of these nuts, a, a cost and access consideration. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yes, there are lots of things that could be good, but if they're not available, the cost is real high, then uh, it's not 
of not valuable. We, for example, we're doing a project right now where we're using a, a new variety developed here by uh, Pat Hayes, a, a barley eater here. It's a, it's a, uh, a hullless barley. Uh, barley's not used in poultry diets simply because it's hard to get the hull off. That's in pearled barley, it's kind of ground off. Well, he's developed a, uh, and there's several different uh, varieties of these over the years of, of, of hullless, where it drops the hull like wheat does. And uh, so we've been we've been using uh, we've been using that, but the but there's still the the hull to deal with, uh, and the amino acids. Absolutely, there there could be uh, some value, but the barley, when we we tried to find organic, this is an organic project, of the organic feeds, uh, they wanted to charge us seventy five cents a pound for hullless barley. Well, that's uh, fifteen hundred a ton. <laughs> When the feed cost, uh, the total prepared feed diet we put in for the project was less than $900 a ton. So uh, it was just way too expensive. So we had to find a different source. It was uh, it was not cleaned. It was right from the field. Uh, they're doing fine on it right now. And so they're laying it virtually maximum or I'm getting 97, 98% uh, production out of, uh, out of birds feeding as high as 50% barley in the diet. So. Uh, it seems to be working at least for the first couple of weeks. Here we go. One last question here. Pam asks, where do guinea fowl fit into the production scheme? Are they considered more with game birds? By definition, guinea fowl are poultry. Uh, the Poultry Products Inspection Act was passed in 1956. It legally defines poultry as chickens, turkeys, Ducks, geese, and guinea fowl. And so by definition, guineas are poultry, quail and partridges are not. <laughs> Seems kind of odd, but that's the way to so By definition, guineas are poultry. If guineas are raised with chickens, they kind of think they're chickens, and so they kind of cubby right up. Um, but there is market for, for guineas, not very big. It's just another one of the game birds. Um, you don't find it uh, other than in very up upscale kinds of restaurants and, uh, and food markets. Uh, but certainly there is room for, for guineas out there and they have the advantage of being poultry, which means when they're processed, if you take them to a federal plant, then uh, the, uh, the taxpayer pays for the inspection fees. If you if uh, inspecting pheasants, then the producer pays the inspection fees. So there is an advantage to being poultry in that respect. Any other questions for Dr. Hermes? I think that is it, online. Well, thank you again, Dr. Hermes, that was excellent. Thanks very, well. very much, we'll be seeing you. Okay, you're welcome to keep listening or at home on a Friday night, up to you. Hopefully uh, you stay dry up there and um, I'll see you, Dr. Kelman and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Sounds good. Uh, at the right. Morgan Small Farms Conference. Absolutely. Okay, thank you again. All right, bye-bye.